Welcome to the Nashville Tribute Band Podcast, The Listening Room with Jason Deere. Coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. Today's topic is the excitement of a bicentennial year and how the Nashville Tribute Band began. We're coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee in the Nashville Tribute Band Studios on Music Row. The official clothier of the Nashville Tribute Band is the Cater Shop. Cater You've shop. heard us talking about it many times. That's Cater with a K. Catershop.com. And of course, if you see us look good, it's all because of the Cater Shop. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's for sure. Of course, we're on a podcast right now and you can't see anything, but man, believe us, we look We good. look incredible, <laughs> yes. Chris and Mike at the Cater Shop. We love those guys. Uh, go online and check them out. This is Jason Deer. And I'm Brad Hull. From the Nashville Tribute Band. And we are so glad that you're here at our podcast today. We love it. And it is time for NTB Mailbag. We've had a lot of people writing in, letting us know what they want to hear on this podcast. And uh, we've loved all of the comments. Uh, But Brad has a few of them that he wanted to share with us today. Sunny in Rigby, Idaho, she sent several suggestions. We love them all. Thank you, Sunny. What do your kids and your wives think about the Nashville Tribute Band and any stories or testimonies from there? That's loaded. Uh, Balancing touring with family, (laughs) uh, how and why you brought the band together in the first place and what inspired you to do it. So we'll uh, cover some of those topics coming up. There's also Chris in Logan, and he said, why did you start NTB and how did you all meet? (laughs) I I wonder if that's like... Why did you guys do that? <laughs> or it was like, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, and then our favorite show performance. So that That's kind of interesting. I'm sure all of us would have a different opinion on that. Then there's Shannon in Frankfort, Kentucky, and she's asking how about letting people know how they can get the NTB to perform in their area. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. As a matter of fact, let's talk about that right now. That's a really simple thing. If you go to NashvilleTributeBand.com, uh, there is a book the band tab at the top and you just click on that and there's a couple of questions you can answer um, So we kind of know what's going on and that actually comes directly to me and Brad so we can we can answer uh, That and give you all the information that you need. Amen. Yeah, because we like to come out and play the music the We like music. it to play the music. We like it to play the country music Deseret book. Let's take a look. All right. We love Deseret Book. They are partners of ours, and they have some great stuff. One of my favorite things that's in their store right now is the journal edition of the scriptures. And I've got one actually in my hand right now, and it's got little margins on the side that you can write and take notes and stuff like that. Love this thing. I spent a lot of time... uh, uh, writing stuff because I have so many great ideas as I read the scriptures. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I, I was I was actually looking at your notes there, and yeah. they are completely illegible. Yeah, well, so that's true. I'm a, yeah, I should have been a doctor, except <laughs> that would never happen. You are a doctor of many things, but but uh, <laughs> uh, me- medicine is not one of them. Yeah. And uh, we could name a few things, other things that you're not a doctor of. <laughs> that's true. All right, now it's time for. Now that's funny. <laughs> All right, Brad, tell us what's funny. The Ottawa Police Service Canadian. said a resident called in the early evening on January Bad. 27th and reported Watch hearing this. what sounded like a young child crying for help <laughs> in a wooded area north of his property. Canadian police said they uh, responded to a report of the child's voice crying for help in the woods <laughs> and discovered a goat with its head stuck in a fence. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, wait, wait a second. I know, was I've it heard, Tom Brady? I've, I've heard goats sound like screaming women, but I mean, <laughs> when does a goat sound like, Mama, help me! Hey, I've heard cats sound like crying babies. Right? I have too. I've heard a mountain lion one time. It sounds exactly like Ooh, a screaming really? woman. Yeah. That's kind of crazy. Yeah, I didn't even know what it was. And my grandpa told me what it was. Weird. All right, that's pretty funny. A goat. If I saw, I mean, we've heard about like clowns in the forest, but, uh, <laughs> you know, hearing a goat scream would be pretty freaky too. Uh, all right. Speaking of clowns, uh, I know this is creepy, but I collected them as a kid. What? Yeah. I had a whole wall, kind of like your wall of uh, gold records over here on Music Row. I had a wall of clowns, like ceramic ones and paper mache ones. and. Do you know how many things that explains? Yeah, (laughs) I know. (laughs) 
<laughs> Actually, I'm going to bring one in here next. <laughs> hey, kids. Hey, kids. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> and other clown voices. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Brad, give us some good news. Give me some of that. Good, 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 good news. This weekend, the Kansas City Chiefs football team won their first Super Bowl in 50, 50 years. years. So as a means of celebrating the historic victory, one of the team's players, defensive tackle Derek Nandy. Naughty. Derek Naughty. <laughs> yeah, say that again. <laughs> I was wondering how to say that. Yeah. I actually looked it up because I couldn't figure it out. So as a means of celebrating the historic victory, one of the team's players, defensive tackle Derek Naughty, paid it forward to his city's local animal shelter, uh, volunteering to pay for all of the adoption fees at the Kansas City Pet Sh- Project in Kansas City, Missouri. That's great If news. you love animals, that's pretty cool. That's, that's amazing. That's, that's awesome. There are great people out there doing stuff. Once again, today's topic is the bicentennial year, which this is a very special year in a lot of ways, and we're all getting ready to find out in General Conference in April exactly how special. I've heard some rumors um, about things that are going to happen, but I don't, I don't know. I don't really buy into rumors, but uh, I'm hoping that some of them are true because some of them sounded pretty cool for conference, so maybe different. The only thing that we need to know is what President Nelson told us, mm-hmm. which is we need to think about what our lives would be like without the restoration, without all of the things that that brought, And uh, that the effort that we put into that and studying the restoration uh, will be a direct result of what we get out of conference. That's Mm. really what we need to know. Is that right? I love that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, sure. Can can I say something? I am so excited that we're doing this. We've been talking about it for months, years, Mm -hmm. and we're finally doing this. This is an opportunity for us to just really connect with you all and share a piece of our hearts with you. So we're excited to start this, and we hope you enjoy it as much as we enjoy doing it. Absolutely. you know. And through this process, we want to hear from you guys. We, we really do. We're going to read everything you send, and we um, do our very best to uh, you know talk about stuff that you want us to talk about and to answer questions. Go to ntblisteningroom at gmail.com and send us, uh, send us what you're thinking. Send us your heart. We'd love to hear people's stories. We'd love to hear their testimonies, um, and it, ma- it makes our day. All right, so for this first podcast, we want to talk a little bit about talk a little bit about how the National Tribute Band began. And it's been quite a process. You know, one of my very good friends from the time that I've been in Nashville is uh, Dan Truman. Uh, we got to know each other pretty early on, and he was a superstar with uh, Diamond Rio. What a beautiful mess, what a beautiful mess I made. And um, Grammy winning. Yeah. And, and what, members of the 15 gra- times nominated. I mean, yeah. talking big dog. They've sold 10 million records. They had, I don't know, a dozen big hits. Mm-hmm. Uh, more than that, probably mm-hmm. a couple dozen. Yeah. Uh, they're members of the Grand Ole Opry. These guys are bona fide, r- the real deal. The real deal! They are. And and so when, when you move to town as young guys, like uh, when Brad and I first got here, we want to be very respectful of not German, not uh, stalking the big dogs. <laughs> But anyway, I, I, had, I had written a couple of songs on when I was a missionary in Las Vegas um, way back in 1989, and um, they were about the restoration of the church, but I never really finished them uh, or did anything with them for years and years. Moved to Nashville, uh, started, you know, and becoming a songwriter and, and trying to do this thing. Moved here in 94, May of 94. My wife and I, we were brand new, didn't know a soul, and just kind of jumped in. And, um, but in 2003... My uh, bishop asked me to uh, teach early morning seminary. And that kind of freaked me out because I was really busy at the time and I was really cool. Can I tell him (laughs) for a second why you were really cool? I know you're not going to talk about it, but what happened between 1994 and 2003? Jason uh, became a mainstay songwriter and producer in Nashville, Tennessee. He... If, as you know, he is uh, one of those personalities that just jumps in and makes things happen, and people uh, automatically just instantly like his personality, and his talent is uh, really unmatched, and he just started writing songs and had songs recorded by some of the biggest artists in the 90s and in uh, 2000s, and so he was a big deal for sure. You were very kind. He was writing songs for Warner Brothers. Remember that? I do remember that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I remember that I'm, eight years. I'm talking to the audience. Uh, <laughs> remember watching uh, Bugs Bunny, and they had the W. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's yep. the company. That's yeah, that's that's the same one, Bugs Bunny. Uh, but anyway, right in the middle of this, my my bishop asked me to teach early morning seminary, and um, I said yes, even though I didn't have any idea how I was going to do it. And I jumped in, and, and with twenty four of the most awesome high school students at Franklin High School um, that I'd ever hung out with, and it was great for me for a lot of reasons. It's good. It's a good idea to hang out with young people. Believe me, it keeps you keeps you young, keeps your mind going. Um, Keeps and you on your feet. For sure, for sure, for sure. And that, that fall in 2003, we were, teaching, um, we were teaching the Old Testament, and all I could think about was restoration, and um, for whatever reason. So all in the morning, I was teaching um, the Old Testament, and at night, I just was reading everything I'd get my hands on about the restoration of the gospel. And um, I started writing, and this is what I do. I have this place that I write. All the guys make fun of me all the time in the band because uh, I, I write songs i write some of my favorite songs that i've ever written in my unfinished basement and uh it's about as inspiring as a white box well it's a, and that's yeah, kind some, of what it is something about the cobwebs and the mice yeah. or something like that that just have always always done it for me and is there so, even a window down there there is oh, okay and i wrote a few songs and then i called dan and i went over to dan's house and i sat down with him and i said hey I know we, he and I have been talking forever about trying to do something to kind of give back or, or just do something for EFY or something, and it hadn't really come together. And I played him a few of these songs, and he started to cry, and I started to cry, which is no surprise. But when Dan started You've to cry, cried. It's kind of, I've never seen you cry. That's weird. <laughs> the whole world seen me cry, sadly. But uh, And Dan said, man, we got to do something with this. And so we, we, we put together um, what ended up being, it was first called Vision to Carthage. Mm-hmm. Was because it was kind of covering from the first vision to uh, to Carthage, and um, uh, and we we put these songs together, and we um, we we didn't think anybody would really care to be honest with you. Kind of you know country versions of of this stuff. We didn't know if anybody would like them or not, but we we set an arrangement with set a meeting with a guy at Deseret Book. Um, this would have been in two thousand and three. And we went in, and, and ironically, there was this girl named Laurel Christensen at the time. She, her name is now Laurel Day, and she was a brand new intern. And she was sitting in that meeting when we played those songs. Well, she now runs Deseret Book pretty much, um, and she is amazing. We, we love her, but I, I always love, we love the fact you, Laurel. that— and we love you, Laurel. Well, I love the fact that she was there right from literally in the beginning. We were so green playing these. And we played some of these songs, and, and the guy— um, uh, who who was awesome? I love this guy. Don Sterling was his name, and he was he listened to these songs, and he um he just he just said I'm really worried about a couple of the songs on there. Uh, one of them was the Porter Rockwell <laughs> song. Yeah. One of them was the last verse of the Emma song because Emma kind of just wasn't dealt with, you know, back in those days. She was everybody was respectful, but just kind of didn't didn't talk about her much. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said I don't know if those two songs will will make it. Onto this record with our committee of people that decides what what we put out, and so and then enter the maverick of that world. <laughs> well, for sure. So we, we decided we're gonna okay, we'll take this to their competitor. The only competitor they had at the time was a guy named Jeff Simpson, who uh, we we love this guy. He was a maverick for sure, and he had this company called Excel, and uh, so we took it over and played it for him, and he. He loved it. He had, a, he had a young guy working for him named John Dayton who did a, a, amazing things and had a great love for it. Matter of fact, he came back to Jeff after hearing it and said, hey, I don't know if anybody will ever listen to this, but you need to put this out. And so we thought, great, we had it. This was in like October of 2003. Mm-hmm. Well, somebody called me in the very first of December and said, hey, have you seen the Salt Lake paper? I said, I live in Nashville. How would I see the Salt Lake paper? <laughs> I have no idea. I've never looked at the Salt Lake paper in my life. And he said, well, it's in, right on there that Deseret Book just bought Excel. And Jeff Simpson is the new vice president under <laughs> Sherry Dew of Deseret Book. And I thought, oh, so no. you're back where you started. <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, like uh, a month later, Sherry Dew calls me, and somebody had given her these work tapes that we had done mm-hmm. of these songs. And she was on a, a church history trip with her family. Um, and they started, in, I think, in uh, Jackson County, and they went through all the church history sites. And she was with her nieces and nephews and whatnot, and they were driving in the car. And she said, We listened to that album the whole way. And she said, this isn't what we usually do at Deseret Book, but it's got the spirit in it and we're going to put it out. And I heard, heard, you know, I'm I'm an Oklahoma guy. That's where I grew up. And Sherry's a a West Kansas farm girl. And uh, I think there's some ways that we really understand each other. And I heard this determination and she said, she said, matter of fact, I took a song across the street to the committee um, that, that, that approves everything you put out. And she said, I just wanted to take one song. So I was like, man, what song did she take over? She probably took over 
you know, The Rising or Emma or something like that. And she said, nope, I took the Porter Rockwell song. Hey, now Porter got an eye like an eagle. And I said, what? <laughs> and she said, I took my favorite song over there. She said, I knew if they were okay with the Porter Rockwell song that they were going to be okay with the whole album. And so... And sure enough, uh, everything was was fine. And so it, you know, the, that um, it came out, and as the very first one in June of 2005, and our lives, all of our lives, uh, dramatically have changed. Absolutely. Since then, it started out with me and Dan and Brad and Matt Lopez were doing just the four of us were doing firesides and small church things that people would ask, would ask us to do, and um, over over the years, I mean. There's a running joke in our band as to how many shows we do because I have a tendency to exaggerate, and I don't know how many it is, but it's a lot. It's, between, it's a lot. It's probably four digits. Between 2004 and now, we've done lots and lots of shows in the U.S. and Canada and uh, China and Australia and Great Britain, and because uh, because we love we love this thing, and 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 over the years. We had, uh, you know, j- just by happenstance, we met each other. Um, you know, Matt and Brad were the first ones, and then and then Tim Gates. We met, and he was he was actually running sound for us on the very that's, first that's show. True. That we, we mentioned did. that the other day. That yeah. was hilarious. He was our sound guy, which is so funny <laughs> because he's he's the best singer in the world <laughs> true, as far true. as we were concerned. And we've had a lot of you play with us in different things over the years. Uh, Tony McClellan, Kendra Lowe, Ryan Shoup. Uh, Mindy Gledhill, Craig Miner, Roger Archibald, Ron Saltmarsh, Catherine Can't Nelson, know. Michael McLean, who we can't believe for a short amount of time he wanted to play with us. We'd love that. Uh, There's another legend. And while absolutely. we're talking about legends. Absolutely. Yeah. Randy Karchner. And then Ben Truman and Chad Truman became kind of mainstays, I don't know, six, seven years ago, five, six years ago. And they've been a strong part of ours. And two, two guys that people don't know a lot about. Uh, Aaron Kopp, who is our sound guy, um, he, he works at BYU in their audio uh, department and mm-hmm. basically is, is part of being in charge of every person that steps to a mic on BYU campus. But he, That's right. he chooses to be out with us, and he's a giant reason why we enjoy being on the road. That's right. He has made our job so easy. His heart is pure as gold, and he uh, truly cares about people, and he's one of the most talented sound men. I mean, I, I've spent... Uh, up until Aaron Cop, I had spent more time in sound checks than I cared to, <laughs> and they were brutal and they were taking years off the end of my life. And when he came along, it just changed everything. For sure, he's an absolute so. pro, and he's such a—he's just so calm. You know, it's, it's when you got a show coming up in a little while and something's going wrong in a sound check, something's going wrong with the equipment. We all kind of freak out because we're all artists and we're all artistic and we're all the weirdos. <laughs> And uh, he just got this calm, very like, calm demeanor, okay. calms us all we'll take down. Care. He does it. <laughs> it's amazing. I remember we, we were getting ready to do a show this past year, and right before the show, Jason says, we need to walk in there with the demeanor of Aaron Kopp. <laughs> and that just says everything. <laughs> right. We all knew what that meant. Uh, another guy who is an unsung absolute member of our band and a hero is a guy named Silvio Rocchetto. He's a Brazilian guy who I met in 1999. And I was working in Emilio Estefan's studio in Miami, down in Coral Gables, on a project. And he was the engineer. And he had just moved from Brazil to the United States. And shortly, uh, you know, we worked on several records together. Mega talented guy. Mega talented and a great guy. Latin Grammy winner. And just three Latin Grammys. Incredible guy. He mixed the first uh, Nashville tribute record. And he's mixed mixed the last one. He is just absolute integral part of the Nashville tribute. We'll definitely talk about him more because he's a he's a he's a big part of this whole thing. But in that process of us doing that first record, I remember he called me because he's he's Catholic. He grew up Catholic, uh, Italian, uh, Brazilian Catholic, and uh, he he called me in the middle of mixing the Emma song that Mindy Gledhill so brilliantly sang, and uh, he couldn't even speak English hardly. Could he, he? he could barely speak English, and he called me, and uh, he said, "Bro, who in the heck is this?" Emma. He said, I'm sitting here mixing this thing and I'm crying and I have no idea who this woman is. Woman is. And uh, amazing. It, was, it was very sweet. And um, um, a couple of years later, we were actually out in Salt Lake. And I remember, again, he stood in front of the Christus, which reminds him of the Jesus in Rio, yeah. you know, somewhat uh, in, in, on, in Temple Square at the. And he, he sat and wept and cried. He's got a really soft heart and he's a very sweet guy. And he, uh, he loves the gospel of Jesus Christ. He loves. 
um, all the things that we do with the Nashville Tribute Band, so we're lucky to have him as a brother. And he absolutely considers his part in this a calling, and it's that's cool because we kind of feel that way as well. We are truly amazed, Brad, that we have uh, our newest album has just come out. It's called uh, Praise, a Nashville Tribute to the Hymns, but it's our eighth Eighth album. album. I can't even believe it. So if you're not familiar with all of them, Joseph, a Nashville tribute to the prophet, came out in 2005. Trek, a Nashville tribute to the pioneers, came out in 2007. That's right. The Work, a Nashville tribute to the missionaries, came out in 2010. And then My Call to Serve, uh, which is a, an extenuation. Yeah, we, we just weren't done talking about missionaries. <laughs> of the missionaries. And that came out in, I think, 2014. That's for sure correct. And then the Redeemer, a Nashville tribute to Jesus Christ, which is for sure one of our favorites, came out in, I don't know when, 2014? Was the same well. year? Yeah, cool. November. And then Mary, a Nashville tribute to Christmas, came out in 2016, and we started our Christmas tour tradition yeah. that year. And then the Word, a Nashville tribute to the Bible, which is really kind of an Old Testament-based album, came out in 17, is that right? September of uh, 17, I think. Uh, 18, actually. Was it 18? Wasn't it 18? Maybe. It was 18. And then Praise, a Nashville tribute to the hymns, came out in January 2020. 10th, 2020. Mm-hmm. We love it. We, um, we, we appreciate you guys. Listen, I want to honestly say our lives will never be the same because of all of you that we have hugged and shook hands with and met after the shows we we're co- probably kind of weird in that we always stay until the last person leaves if we unless unless it's not possible for some reason and then somebody hands us a broom when we start sweeping <laughs> that's right that's right but we love the people we love to look into your eyes and when we get to meet you and we love to hear about your testimonies and and your struggles life is messy it's ugly it's it's hard and uh, we, we know that, and we know that the gospel is what, what, uh, what keeps us strong, and it's, there's, there's a brotherhood. There's, there's a new song on our, on our new album called... Um, In His Love. Called In His Love, and, and the reason that we love it is because it, it kind of says something that, that we haven't heard in the hymn before, and that is Jesus is the only way that we're going to make it through all this, but in the, in the meantime, as we take advantage of His atonement, we've got to lean on each other, and we've got to love on each other, and help each other get through the ups and downs. That's for sure. And that's what this is all about. The Gospel of Jesus Christ is all about that. Nashville Tribute Band is all about that. And uh, I know for sure the the prophet and all the leaders of the church right now are all about that. And uh, if we can cling together and cling to the rod, cling to the Gospel of Jesus Christ, His atonement, all of those things, we can make it through. That's the goal. Amen. That's what we say down here when somebody says some truth. Amen. Amen. That's right. Hey, a couple of quick things, things coming up for the Nashville Tribute Band. Uh, we're going to be in Kinston, North Carolina on March the 7th. We don't know a whole lot of details about that. We hear that it's sold out already, but maybe you know some people if you're near the East Coast and you can get there. And then July 9th, Hill Kimura Pageant. This is the uh, final year of the pageant, is that correct? Yes. And uh, 6 p.m. Uh, on July 9th, Nashville Tribute Band concert for one hour. And then the production of the Hill Kimura Pageant. Yeah, and I've never seen that pageant. But uh, as a matter of fact, I, I'd never seen a pageant until we saw Nauvoo a few years ago. And then we saw uh, Manti not long after that. And they're, they're awesome traditions and really, really cool. And the, the Nauvoo pageant is fantastic. I mean, Yes, it is. So I'm hoping that this one is great, too. And uh, it's amazing that it's the last year that, that this is going to happen. But we're excited. There's going to be a lot of people. If any of you are going to go to that, get your hotel rooms now because it's going to get crazy, I think, um, mm-hmm. from what we've been told. Uh, in April, we are very excited to be involved in, in something that we can't believe we're in the middle of and we're honored and humbled. Um, the student leadership of the various institutes of religion um, decided to be a part of a million meals in March. They wanted to feed people, and this thing has grown into a lot of amazing organizations that are involved in this thing yes, uh, with the Utah Food Bank, utahfoodbank.org. We're going to do concerts up and down the Institutes of the Wasatch Front, April 3rd to April 17th. So we'll be playing eight of those, and those are uh, just kind of big rally in the troop kind of activities. Uh, but what a wonderful thing. And it started, again, with student leadership there at Weber, and uh, it grew from there. And just an amazing example of what the Lord wants us to do, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. 
make and, things happen. And we're just, we're just grateful to put a little bit of background music to some people working hard and some young kids that really did a great thing. If you want, whether you live in Utah or not, go to utahfoodbank.org and give a dollar, give $20, just give some, you, you, you can Venmo, which is pretty, mm-hmm. makes it really easy. Give a buck. And um, they're, they're some awesome people doing some awesome things for some people that need it. And uh, I love that. We love you guys. We're going to be back next week. Yes, we will. We're going to do this every week. And uh, thank you for listening to the Nashville Tribute Band Listening Room. Have a great week. Nashville Tribute Band Listening Room. You've been listening to the Nashville Tribute Band Podcast, The Listening Room with Jason Deer. Nashville Tribute Band Listening Room. Make sure and subscribe to our podcast and share it with your friends. And visit NashvilleTributeBand.com for music, information, and so much more. And make sure and enjoy this podcast each and every week.